Well, welcome. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Are you guys rolling now? Or? All set. Yep. Thank you. I never thought when I started on this visit here, I'd ask if you're rolling, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Things change. Yes, they do. <laughs> All right, Mayor Fenizio, welcome you here today. Um, we're joined by members of our new staff as well as uh, our editorial board. Um, but uh, just to clarify, the, we'll certainly weigh in their opinions and what they take away from the interview, but the endorsement decision will rest with uh, Gary Farouge, our publisher, and myself, Paul Shawnee, the editorial page editor, just to kind of clarify the, that wall between news and, and opinion and for the sake of uh, uh, recording as well. Um, so uh, just to get started, uh, I asked at the debate um, about uh, what you, well, it was a two-part question. The second part question was uh, missed any, your biggest mistake and what you may have learned from it. And uh, uh, you had kind of a pithy answer with the, the hat, which was uh, got a few laughs, certainly. But I think I even got David to laugh briefly, which was very, very much an achievement of mine. I, I'm going to put that on my list of greatest achievements. So. I, think, I think David has mentioned the hat. Uh, so. Once or twice. <laughs> but who's, I'm not counting. I'm not, I'm not counting. But, but. Yeah, but seriously, uh, it was certainly must have been a learning curve being the first mayor in nearly a century in New London. And uh, if you could talk about maybe what uh, a different aspect of having gone through this and way, what you may have learned and how a Finizio, second of Finizio administration might be uh, different in any way from that experience uh, of having uh, served a first term. Well, I believe that it was very, very difficult uh, to come in as the first mayor in 90 years. Uh, first of all, it's a sea change in political culture in a community, for t particularly for people who have lived in the community their entire lives under one form of government. And now suddenly they have an entirely new form of government, uh, and that new form of government is headed by someone who did not grow up in the community or grow up in the community's politics. So that change was a significant one. There's also a change in ideology, which was difficult uh, for many in the community to adjust to. Uh, it's been my belief for five years, uh, and I've said it repeatedly, that the vast majority of the people in New London are progressive uh, and have very different attitudes and views than the prevailing political attitudes that the establishment uh, in New London favored, which I think tends to be more conservative. So there was also a shift there. Uh, but regardless of those factors, there was also the simple factor that there was nothing to compare what you were doing to. Uh, when you're the first of anything, the only thing you can be compared to is everyone's idea of what the ideal mayor would be, uh, which means that you are almost doomed to fall short uh, in almost everyone's eyes to some extent, uh, whereas if there had been five mayors before me, uh, it might provide a different perspective. But that's not the case. We have to deal with what we have to deal with. All of that said, I do believe there's been a significant learning curve. Uh, and I think that my style as mayor has improved. And I have learned when to uh, use the bully pulpit of my office, which sometimes I was criticized for, uh, press conferences, et cetera, that were foreign to New London politics. But the reality is, is that is one of the significant powers of this office, is to use this voice and to use this role to push an agenda forward. Uh, your editorial about the quality of the mayoral debate I thought was a very good one. That's the whole purpose of a mayoral system is that people compete with ideas, you get a clear sense of what those ideas are, and if they get elected, they'll use the authority of the office to push them forward. But that was entirely new to New London. So a lot of the accusations of uh, being overly dramatic, some of them uh, I'll claim full credit for, and my fault, mea culpa, but many of them were simply reactions to the fact that we'd never had a mayor before. And any time the mayor exerted that role, it was very difficult for people to adjust to. Uh, so I think I've learned when to push, when not to push, uh, when to have my name on things, and when to vanish. Uh, and there's one good example that I will give you, uh, and that's the National Coast Guard Museum. Uh, you'll note in the debate when I said, look, one of the significant economic development achievements in my administration is the attraction of the National Coast Guard Museum. There are a lot of groans from my opposition. Uh, the reason for that is that despite the fact that I went to D.C., <coughs> negotiated directly with Admiral Papp, that negotiation, Admiral Papp will say publicly, led to his decision to announce the museum here in New London, 
which we did in a communication after that visit. Then I went to the property owners, put together the commitments to get the abutting property owners on board. I went to the governor and the secretary of OPM, secured a $20 million commitment for the pedestrian bridge. I went to New London Landmarks and other groups that had opposed the pedestrian bridge, got them on board. But then we announced it, and David wrote a column actually that said, you can see Mayor Finizio piping everyone aboard for his second term or something like that. And immediately I said, oh no, this thing's in danger. Because as I said at the opening of the debate, people play the person, not the politics. And if this became my achievement, it would jeopardize it, particularly when the land transfer could be subjected to referendum, particularly when the museum is going in city center district where there are a lot of people who are very active, often opponents of mine. So I pretty much immediately at that point took myself out of the project. Uh, apart from the major events where I was publicly there, uh, most of the work that I did on that project from that point on was behind the scenes. And I transferred most of it to Tammy Doherty to act as an intermediary and to work with these folks who now love Tammy Doherty after initially not liking Tammy Doherty uh, to continue to move the land transfer along, uh, the sale of Union Station along, uh, which required a lot of moving levers uh, from different boards and agencies and so on and so forth that are often staffed with many of my opponents. So I knew enough when not to be involved. And I think that that is something that's been critical uh, in learning. And it's tough to learn when to exert certain aspects of your influence and when you know that your name on something could be more harm than good, when to push, when not to push, how far to push. Uh, and that's still a learning process and it depends on in any given year who's on the city council and, and what the dynamics are and what you guys are reporting, uh, what the political uh, uh, hubbub and buzz is at the moment, where the focus of attention is. Uh, and that's something that I think you almost have to be mayor for a certain amount of time to really learn the dynamics of. Um. Would you utilize the uh, CAO position any differently in a second administration? Absolutely. Uh, we need a professional uh, operating officer. And that would be the case regardless of the qualifications of the mayor. Now, I would state that many of the significant advancements that my administration would now claim credit for, whether it's the magnet school plan, the minimum wage increase, uh, the Coast Guard Museum land transfer, all occurred when Lorna Tush was acting as CAO. So, you know, I have been capable uh, on my own at fulfilling the role of uh, uh, managing city affairs while simultaneously lobbying in Hartford and doing all the other ceremonial duties of my job, but it is too much. Uh, but I don't complain too loud about it because in every city department that's what we're doing. We're understaffed across the board and everyone's had to make do with what we've got and move the ball forward. And in spite of uh, tough circumstances and tough budgets, we've done that. But realistically speaking, even if you had the most capable mayor in the world, uh, the mayor has to be pulled in too many different directions. And you need someone who is far more detail-oriented. You need someone else that local people can go to if they have concerns and know that they can get action on particularly minor issues. Uh, and have someone that can be day-to-day -day at City Hall all day involved more in depth with the bureaucracy and bureaucratic challenges that we have while the mayor's off in Hartford and, and the mayor's off cutting a ribbon and the mayor's doing everything else that the mayor has to do. Um, but that was not possible when Jane Glover left uh, due to illness, unfortunately, and she was fulfilling that role very ably uh, because she was only budgeted at $80,000. And if you look around at CAOs, professional CAOs in comparable communities or deputy mayors or chiefs of staff, they're making somewhere in the mid-600 range, if not double six, uh, double six figures, excuse me, uh, 160000 140000 you know, these are the, 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 the salaries of these people. So I used to tell Jane all the time, you're not allowed to leave or die because if you do, we're never going to get anybody else who'd be willing to fill the job for this little pay, no overtime, no nothing, and it's a full-time, round-the-clock sometimes job. So I did include in my budget funding for a full-time CAO at $100,000, which is still low, but would be the highest paid official in my administration that I've hired and set a salary for, uh, but at least it's something that I feel could attract a good professional person to the post. Uh, during the budget cycle, uh, obviously it wasn't my budget that was adopted, it was Mr. Passero's budget that was adopted, and I believe that there are a lot of problems with that budget that we'll have to correct mid-year, but the funding for the CAO position is still in the budget, and assuming that I can balance the budget without cutting that funding, which I believe is possible, uh, then I will fill the position as soon as I'm reelected. 
Uh, indeed, uh, if re-elected, I would immediately start posting for the position so that we can get that process started. Can I ask, why is the why is your chief administrative officer <coughs> here today? If this is a political meeting, she is on vacation time, and so am I. <laughs> and we take vacation time when we do political things or other things, not sick time. David, uh, David had a question on on. Um, on priorities and, and where you uh, devote your time. Uh, yeah, I, um, uh, I understand that your attendance at the COG meetings are very low. In fact, I, I, I think the figure for last year was 30% attendance. Mm -hmm. um, your opponent attends almost all of them? Is no, he hasn't like attended a COG meeting in quite a while. I, well, think I over wonder why your attendance is so low. I've attended many of them, uh, and what's more important is that the general meetings are really pro forma. Uh, I know Paul's been to a few. I don't know how many you've been to, David, but the general COG meetings are more meet and greets among the, the regional heads. Uh, the, the meetings roll along, they approve a bunch of S-tips and T-pips pretty much without discussion, and then everyone goes home within an hour. Uh, sometimes I have events in the morning here uh, that I feel are a higher priority. But whenever the COG is debating something uh, of consequence or if I don't have a conflict, I attend. Uh, but where I attend significant numbers of meetings are the committees. Uh, so, for example, this past year I attended all the legislative committee meetings of the COG and got the COG unanimously to endorse uh, having the $200 million bonding package put on the state uh, eligibility list this year through the legislature. So, as mayor, what do you judge someone on? How many particular meetings they attended or whether they got the result that you want from that agency? Now, in terms of capital improvement projects, New London's gotten more funding through COG than any other community in this region under my administration. We got over $400,000 for upgrades to the train station, which will assist uh, the Coast Guard Museum project. We got a unanimous approval from COG uh, for the including on the bonding list for our community of our school construction project, but also in other committees of COG, like the Seat Bus Advisory Committee. And this was another thing that I didn't put my name on. Uh, because Peg Curtin, who is a, a opponent of mine, is our seat board representative from New London. And also we wanted to make sure the significant transportation change in New London didn't get caught up in politics. But I attended every meeting, you can check, of the seat board advisory committee, which redesigned and did the studies that redesigned our seat bus routes. And those seat bu bus routes are going to be a tremendous improvement to people in New London, especially going back and forth through Groton. It cleaned up this absolute mess of a of a transportation nightmare and also created a more direct link to Three Rivers, the community college. This will assist Dr. Rivera who's trying to build a better link between our magnet schools and Three Rivers to have that better transportation link. Now when it was ultimately done we put the map up on my office Facebook page just so that people knew but we didn't trumpet it out with press releases. We weren't saying that I was going to these meetings. We weren't you know, making a big deal about it because it was more important to me to get it done than to get it caught up in politics. Um, but I attended all of those meetings. So, you know, I have to be at the legislature. I attended most of the committee hearings related to bills in New London. Sometimes I couldn't go. I submitted written testimony. I attend COG meetings. I attend COG committee meetings. I've attended city center district meetings. But I haven't attended all of them. I've attended planning and zoning meetings. Just this week I attended a personnel board meeting. But there are three, four board meetings every single night. And there are events all over all the time. And without a professional CAO and doing everything virtually by myself, uh, I can't be at everything all the time. Uh, but I don't have to be to get results. Uh, and I believe that the results speak for themselves. Um, as to the city council, something you didn't ask about but I'll address, I haven't been to the city council uh, since Passero decided on the veto override. Uh, because I knew that the council is completely politicized until after uh, the primary. I watched it four years ago. Beseto and Perro and Olson were like, particularly Beseto and Perro, just killing each other. The meetings turned into an absolute circus. Nothing got done, and they passed the worst budget that we've seen in 20 years that almost led to us running out of cash. Uh, my sense was that to be at council right now would simply overly politicize uh, the issues before council, particularly concern, a particular concern of mine is the Lighthouse Inn. Uh, I think the council is moving in the right direction on the Lighthouse Inn. But heaven forbid I show up and say what my opinion would be, because that will be the wrong opinion almost immediately. Um, and I didn't want to jeopardize that moving forward. Um, there are other issues pending before council that unfortunately are not moving forward. I had hoped that 
As a matter of course, the body camera issue would have gone through. Uh, we need to purchase new snow plows for the winter. Uh, winter is coming. Uh, we are predicted to have a worse winter than last winter, but they are still holding up those requests because Mr. Pastor is trying to make some kind of obscure political point that makes absolutely no mathematical sense, but translates sometimes into good political rhetoric. Uh, but we are holding up essential things. And the more I would be there, I think the more things would get held up, the more things would get politicized. Um, but I will go back immediately after the primary and win or lose, and mark my words, all these things are going to fly right through uh, once the politics is taken, taken out of the air. Uh, I also don't mind saying that there is a certain amount of political strategy in it. Uh, Mike Passero isn't on the front page. If I'm at every council meeting while he's playing politics and he engages me and I engage him, you have a front page story. I presume. Uh, Mike Passero is on page B7. Sometimes he's not even quoted. Why would I want to give my political opponent who thinks he's well known in the community but really isn't that well known in the community a front page platform for four months before an election to debate me and be raised to my level of name rack effectively through an election cycle. That makes no strategic sense, uh, especially if that debate would not help me or help move any policies forward and probably only serve to hold more policies up. So sometimes you go and sometimes you don't go. Sometimes you put your name on things and sometimes you don't. Sometimes you send out a press release, sometimes you hold a press conference. But the ultimate goal is that the policies advance, the things get done, <clears throat> and the things are getting done. And if I don't get all the credit for it, fine. If I get enough credit for it to get reelected, I'll take that. Uh, but the bottom line is reelected or not reelected, the things have to get done, and I believe they are getting done under my administration, and I have no confidence that they'll get done in the same way or with the same efficiency uh, under a Passero administration, and that's why I'm here. Uh, after one term, what, what, how would you describe your philosophy of the mayor vis-a-vis -vis the relationship with the council? Mr. Passero talks mm -hmm. about an extremely close cooperative relationship that he, he would seek, seek to foster with the council. You know, what's, how do you see their, their different roles and how would that play out in sure. the second term? I think it depends significantly on who's on the council. Uh, and Mr. Passero has said that I have bad relations with the council, I won't work with the council, it's all about my drama, 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 drama. I've heard this for four years. Um, the drama, the conflict, is as much, if not more, on Mr. Passero's side than mine. But as the mayor, you're the one that bears the ultimate responsibility. Everyone looks at the executive, everyone knows your name, so whatever's happening, they figure it must be on your end. But the reality is, as I came into office and our professional financial team said, you have a major deficit. And Mr. Passero's immediate response was, no, we don't. There is no deficit. This is all government by ambush. It's a lie. He's a liar. And it's been that same same, same rhetorical answer to everything for four years. Even in the debate, after we've had multiple audits, <coughs> after the rating, agency, rating agencies have been in, check registers have been online, audits, supplemental audits have all been done, you've opined multiple times looking at the same evidence, the facts are clear. And he's still standing up there saying it's a false narrative, we managed our money fine. You know, you can work with a council if the council wants to work with you, but when a council is adamantly saying, no, we do not want to change, we do not want to accept this reality, and we are going to fight you from day one, well then, you have to use the unilateral authorities of your office, you have to push, you have to use political staging and strategy to, to, to get things forward, or else they will make sure that nothing gets forward so that you are judged a failure, they vote you out, and they come back in and go back to the policies that they had, which is what they've wanted. Um, Mike has said numerous times publicly that he and the other members of the council voted for the mayor position because they believed it would be one of them or one of their friends. I mean, his exact words and they never expected that the people of New London might take this office into their own hands and do something different with it. And they see me as a mere hiccup in their long-range plan, and once they get rid of me, you know, New London's true leaders, quote-unquote, will, will be back in power. And that has led to significant adversarial relationships with the council. Can but you if, kind of be specific about when you talk about that, who those people are? Like you said, Mr. 
sure. Pass Road. I mean, like when you well, you can I've look at who was there. You didn't say Isn't it right Wade now, Heislip but I hope as much I know part of the whole guard is anyone. Wade Heislip ran a vicious primary with Peg Curtin for state rep. Peg Curtin and Wade Heislip have never been on the same side. Well, Jane and Wade are far more progressive than them, and that was always a factional split. Uh, the Saddies were more moderate than the Basilicas and the Bassettos, who are far more conservative. Basilicas and Bassettos are supporting Mike Passero. All the former leaders of the NLDC well, Mike Pass supporting Mr. Passero's, Mike Passero. Mr. Passero's campaign manager is Kevin Cavanaugh, who, I don't know, he's been in the city, I'm going to guess, 10 or 15 years. I mean... Mr. Cavanaugh is extremely conservative. He is an extremely, extremely I, conservative I Democrat. What it is, and I, I'm, I've heard you say this before. You didn't say today. What is old guard? What does that mean? Is it? Is it? What is that? The dominant faction of the Democratic Town Committee for decades would be who I would classify who have a much more conservative ideology as the New London old guard. Uh, that pushed eminent domain, uh, that kept people out of the Democratic Party and the DTC, uh, and they dominated it, and they use very tough tactics uh, to do it. Uh, they're very loud. Uh, they put up a lot of signs on all of the buildings that they own. They did it for Bassetto in 09, and he was almost voted off council. I think he only won seven seat by about six votes, uh, but he had twice as many lawn signs up as Mr. Passero does now. I mean, this is this is the attitude. You have guys like Reed Burdick who, you know, files ethics complaints against you and stalks you around town and takes pictures of you. And I mean, this is this is kind of what they do, and they've done it for years, and they've been able to intimidate a lot of people uh, and run other people out of town, even uh, superintendents, city managers, you name it. Um, but they can't do that to me. Uh, I live here. I'm not going anywhere. And I'm the mayor, and I'm not accountable to them, and I don't get intimidated by them. I'm accountable to all the people of the city. And I don't think the people of the city want those conservative policies. And I don't think they want many of those same people who were in charge before I came along uh, coming back into power. Uh, it would be a reversal, I think, of a lot of the progressive uh, progress that we've made that I think resonates very well with the people of New London. Um, which is perhaps the only criticism I would give of uh, this institution. Uh, I don't think anyone, does anyone sitting at the table, Lisa, do you live in New London? I do. I think you're the only one. And is anyone here under the age of 50? Greg over there. Um, <laughs> and you're all, you're all white. Uh, the city of New London, the median income is under $23,000 a year. Over 80% of our school students uh, qualify for free or reduced student lunch. Over 85% are minority, 56% Latino. One in five New Londoners speak Spanish as their primary language. You know, when I read in your pages your opinions on what the pulse of New London is, I've always thought you're a bit off base. Um, the pulse of New London is in a lot of people that I don't think the quote-unquote New London Old Guard, or sometimes this editorial board, really talks to. Uh, but I do, every day. And uh, they know exactly who the Old Guard is. Uh, they know exactly what their policies were. They lived under them. You know, I've talked to so many people who had to move from Fort Trumbull when their homes were bought out or bulldozed. I've talked to a lot of people who had to move even earlier than that during urban renewal if their families or themselves have been here long enough. I go to doors where people lift up their pant legs and show me the bite marks from our canines uh, that, they, that they suffered and filed civilian complaints that went nowhere. Uh, I've talked to people who went to the New London school system with rooms that have plastic over a window where a window should be because we're the first community in the history of the state of Connecticut to level fund our schools five years in a row. I mean, the people of New London lived under those kind of policies, where schools were neglected, where homes were bulldozed, where we had very, very, very unacceptable police tactics going on. And they know it's changed. They've lived through the change. And they don't want to go back. And on all of those kinds of issues, Mike Passero has been on the other side in his votes on the city council and or is now allied with all of the people who instituted those policies. So what is the team that he's coming into office with, it's the same old team. And I don't hate those people. I don't want those people to leave New London. And I want to serve those people. And after the election, 
go right back to the DTC, I'll go right back to City Center District and say, okay, time to get back to work and we'll see how many people want to get back to work or how many people are going to fight you for all eternity. That may exist. Oh well. You know, not everyone's going to agree. And I criticize Mr. Passero actually for believing that you can come into New London politics and just create one big consensus. Now come on. You guys have followed New London politics for a long, 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 long time. I've read your paper for a long, 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 long time. There will always be conflict in politics in general, and there will almost certainly be disagreements in New London politics, and they'll probably wind up being colorful ones, whether I'm here or not. We need a mayor who has a clear idea of where he wants to lead the city and is willing to walk through some of the criticisms and, yes, face opposition to get it done. Because if you're doing anything in this town, you're going to get opposition, and there's going to be controversy. It's not going to be easy, um, and I believe that I have a demonstrated ability to do that, and I think that the direction in which I'm leading the city resonates far more with the people of New London, who are the actual voters, who are the actual people who live here, uh, than the message that they get from the old guard. I, I don't think it resonates with them. I think it just resonates with their own people, and I think that they have psyched themselves up and they are very fired up and they are very angry and they're very upset and they're very loud and they're very active, <clears throat> but you don't count past a hundred of them. You need a lot more than that to win a primary and you need a lot more than that to win an election. Um, in um, Going back to January 2012, you, t you mentioned uh, police and community mm -hmm. relations. Um, we had had a, a video, a, an officer caught on video, uh, dropping a dime on a suspect, and and you announced um, mm -hmm. that state police were assisting your administration in an investigation into possible corruption, corruption in the London Police Department. I found the quote at the time, the city of New London is grateful for the support of the Connecticut State Police as we continue an ongoing and expanding probe into possible corruption in the New London Police Department. So it seems that at that point we're in perhaps for a real house cleaning in the New London Police Department. And then it just seemed to, was that investigation ever concluded? What did it find? Where do we stand with uh, the trust level within our police department? Sure. I'm very glad you asked that because this has been, and I said this to Greg Smith uh, in my profile interview, it's been one of the most frustrating and difficult parts of my job has been the reform of the new London Police Department. Uh, but I want to go into this a little bit. I know your time's limited, but I think this is a very important topic. Uh, my background, uh, which I know, David, sometimes you've uh, slightly belittled, uh, is that I worked as an analyst for the New York City Council. I was a statistician, and I had been trained at NYU, a very, very good school. I've got A's in all my statistics courses. I'm pretty good with numbers. and. What I would study was the actual racial data from police stops in New York. I would analyze this as part of uh, a process where we wrote a new bill, which was signed by Mayor Giuliani. I have a picture of me standing behind him at the signing on September 6, 2001, five days before 9-11, which was designed to collect the data better so that we could prohibit racial profiling. I argued this in college, I argued this in law school. I taught this when I taught at Northeastern, how to study racially disparate impact in law enforcement programs. And I'm very familiar with the Civil Rights Act and its racial disparate impact test for whether a, a, a something violates the act. When I came to New London and saw what was going on in the police department, and not just someone allegedly planting a bag on someone, but an officer shooting an unarmed person whose hands were visible five times, an internal police report conducted by Captain Steve Crowley, someone who in his own past had to shoot and kill a suspect, so not someone with a bias towards police, says it was an improper shoot. The police chief recommends termination. The personnel administrator recommends termination. Felt that was valid and I did terminate that employee, but that wasn't the only thing going on. We also had uh, multiple cases of police abuse, multiple civilian complaints coming in. Uh, a questionable incident outside the SCAD facility. I mean, it, it, was, it was like the wild, wild west. And it was totally unacceptable. And I remember a meeting in my office, I think with the three of you, where David asked the question, you know, look at all this stuff. What are you going to do about this? Are you going to do something about this? I absolutely am going to do something about this, but it's not easy. Uh, the state police did come in in that investigation. It was actually uh, the troop from Hartford 
um, because Todd Lynch is a veteran of the Troop uh, E uh, from Eastern Connecticut. So we wanted to make sure it was a troop that had no connection to anyone in the police department when the investigation was conducted. I also spoke to uh, Senator Blumenthal about the issue and his office. His office informed me that they can't directly contact FBI and U.S. Attorney and so on and so forth under federal law, but I made them aware of the situation. And then I wrote out an affidavit, uh, which was sent to the uh, U.S. Attorney. Um, a bunch of other information was sent there. FBI did come in. They looked at things. But I think that the bottom line that they came to was, well, these people are gone. You know, that officer who planted the drugs, he resigned. And he's gone. And, well, you shut down your canine unit. Despite all the controversies, our last dog bite was June of 2013. I shut it down. Um, so the federal government has such limited resources, and the problems with law enforcement being now exposed by the Black Lives Matter movement, of which I'm very proud to support, uh, they can't be everywhere. I mean, there are a million Fergusons. Uh, this is not unique to one community. Uh, in fact, when I went to one prosecutor, I won't say who, uh, and said, look, we've got this tape of this officer. You're going to indict this person. The person had already resigned. And they said, why would we do that? It happens in every community. The attitude amongst law enforcement was this acknowledgement that now nationally I think people are starting to awaken to that we have fundamental problems with law enforcement in this country and how it affects African Americans in particular. And that leads me to the canine unit. And this is the last thing I'll say about it. This one bothered the heck out of me. 40, at the time I ran the numbers, 45% of the population was minority. 52% of the arrests are minority. Nine out of 10 of the dog bites are minority. This is what I did professionally. I'm an attorney. This, I know this law. This is a violation of the Civil Rights Act. This is a racially disparate impact violation of the Civil Rights Act. And I said it to the City Council. Memo of April 19, 2012 to Councilor Spicacci, opinion from the Law Department, all sorts of other, my veto message, testimony before the Council, on and on and on. They'd said, that's legal, this is Passero now, a lawyer himself. That's legal mumbo jumbo, and this is what he said, and the police union said, and they're about to say again in a big press conference, they're going to hold on the 10th. The mayor's just playing the race card, playing the race card for his own political benefit. What a great political benefit I got out of this fight. It was the worst fight, and I lost. There's no political benefit. But here's the Ferguson Department of Justice Civil Rights Division report look at it, and it talks about the canine program, and it talks about the canine program. Ferguson's police use of canines on low-level unarmed offenders is unreasonable. And when you look at the data, you find that their racially disparate impact was closer and smaller than the one we had here, which was broader and wider. Our program violated the Civil Rights Act. It did. Just, it's a fact. It's a mathematical fact. And I've had to fight that issue and argue that issue, and that's been one of the most frustrating things I've had to deal with. Because it's become, if you want to reform the police, you're anti-cop, and I'm not. I have family members who are police. I see the job the police do in New London. They do an incredible job. They do the most difficult job we have. But they should have body cameras on. They should go through civil rights training. We should not be strip searching people in the middle of a radio shack in the middle of the day. We shouldn't be sicking dogs on unarmed people. We shouldn't be shooting unarmed people. We shouldn't be planting drugs on people. And that should not be controversial. That should be something that we as a community absolutely agree on. And if anyone is using this for political benefit, it's Mr. Passero, because he thinks it can rile up some votes with the worst political motivation that you can ever use, which is fear which is if we don't have these types of tactics, if we don't back up the police, if we don't get tough, there's going to be more crime. Except that since these reforms, and since we've put people through retraining, and since we've changed how we do dispatch, and since we did our anti-panhandling initiatives, and our public beautification projects, and community policing, and all the stuff that they scoffed at four years ago, saying it was coddle the criminal, if you remember, well, guess what? Crime's been cut in half in New London. It's been cut in half in half, <laughs> and we just went through our safest summer ever, and we just had our safest sail fest in the history of sail fest, only six arrests. It's a bloody miracle. So we can lower crime, 
we can have a safe community. We're rehiring cops. We're hiring diverse cops. We're hiring bilingual cops, which we desperately need. Because you show up like we did at the Christmas murder. What's that? How many police have you hired in the last? Four. And we're going to hire two every academy shift. And people are retiring in the top end. People are coming in the bottom end, which is a little cheaper. We're keeping the budget balanced. We're slowly increasing the ranks. Crime's cut in half. We're hiring more diverse people. We're putting them through better training. And hopefully soon, as soon as Mr. Pastor stops dragging his feet on the council, or as soon as the election's over and we can take the politics out of it, they'll all have body cameras. And the bad old days of the wild, wild west in downtown New London that I saw with my own two eyes when I came here in 2005, not as a member of the majority here, not as someone that anyone knew here, as a totally anonymous outsider, new to town, gay, married to a Puerto Rican drag queen, many of whose fellow friends, fellow queens are black. And when you walked around the street in New London in 2005 with black and Hispanic people and you're not from town and you're a 20-something, you get a very different visual of how the New London police interacted with people. Now, they never interacted negatively with me. This is not a personal issue for me. But as someone who did this work for so long, cares about these issues for so long, comes to New London and sees that going on. And I saw people being beaten in the street, senselessly, for no reason whatsoever. I saw it myself. So no one can tell me that it was or it wasn't bad back then. It was bad. And we changed it. And it needed to change. Um, and that's just how I feel about it. And, and I'm never going to feel differently about it. Because when you find something that violates the Civil Rights Act, when you find that the federal constitutional rights of people, whether it's at Fort Trumbull, whether it's in the police department, in my opinion, you must act. The mayor of New London must act to protect the people of New London. And if they want to accuse me of drama for doing that, or divisiveness, I say to them, I'm not being divisive. Your policies are divisive. And in this community, this diverse community, this working poor community, that's unacceptable. What did you do when you saw people, uh, police beating people senseless in the street? At the time, being a resident of police Rhode police? Island, no. You just watched it occur? Stood by while the police beat someone senseless on the street? I ran for mayor, David, and I stopped it. That's what I did moved here, I ran for mayor, and I stopped it. But I'm going to tell you that when I saw it back then, all I thought was, oh, this is Providence in the 70s. You can't do anything about this, because who are you going to call? Who's the public safety chair of the city council? Mike Bassetto, who says we need to get tough on our frequent flyers, says we need over 100 cops, says we should relocate all the homeless to a facility in a former prison in Niantic whose best friend is Jay Wheeler. And Jay Wheeler is who now? Oh, that's right, chair of the Police Community Relations Board. Oh, and that's right, they're hanging out with Todd Lynch all the time, and they're out drinking, and they're doing this, they're all buddies. And they're over at Pesetto's restaurant all the time. Who are you going to call? Who's going to change it? The union president? No. The Police Community Relations Board chairman? Uh-uh. The city councilor? Nobody was going to change it. That's why it wasn't changing. That's why it was getting worse. And crime was going up at the same time. So those tactics weren't working. We changed it. Crime is down and abuse is down. And that's what matters. Um, we have a lot of topics to cover. One more police question. The, did you mishandle the situation, Chief Ackley, and, and what happens going forward with uh, leadership over in our police department? Well. What I will say about the chief is that I've supported the chief and I still support the chief when it comes to civil rights. The chief and I agree on all of these points and have agreed on these points. So I have every confidence that with Chief Ackley at her post, if it's her desire to remain at her post, which is her choice and her choice alone, that at the very least we will not have a reversion uh, to bad police uh, uh, behavior and tactics. Um, other than that, what I can say is what I said in the debate. There have been controversies and issues with the chief since before I became mayor. They persisted while I was mayor. Uh, and many of the people who now support Mr. Passero, uh, leaders of city center district, leaders of the police union, Mr. Passero himself, other members of the city council, uh, were calling for either an investigation, a suspension, 
or uh, for the chief to retire, or many for the chief to be outright fired. Uh, and this went on, as you know, for years. Finally, I was in an email exchange with the chief, and I felt that something was definitely wrong. Uh, so much so that when you read the same emails, you opined that the chief should go. Uh, I also had members of the administrative staff, department heads coming up to me, telling me the chief is out to get you. Uh, she is doing this and she is doing that and she is doing this other thing. And I reported all of this to the investigator, Elder Gill. She spoke to some of those people, not all of those people, and she issued her report. It exonerated the chief, so be it. We went to mediation twice in her lawsuit. Chief was out for an extended period of time, gave the chief an opportunity to really consider what she wanted to do. And the ultimate result of the mediation of the chief's own internal uh, you know, thoughts uh, and the investigation was that the chief is still the chief and she's back. And that's the state law and that's what whoever is elected mayor is going to have to live with. All I can say is if the chief is the chief, she'll have my support and I have given her every ounce of my support since her return. She's under no restrictions from me. I'm not interfering in any way with what she's doing. Uh, and I'm here to back her up when needed. Uh, but ultimately, the chief has to decide herself, because she has full legal protection, whether she feels she can effectively lead the department. And if she feels she can, state law is clear. She's chief of police. Other people may feel differently, but that's irrelevant. It's up to her. Um, Lisa, I didn't know if your question's already been answered that you had on... Uh... Almost, but um, it takes us back for a second to the issue of um, racial relations in general in the city. Um, so many American cities are having such problems, and a lot of it is about police, and I think you've addressed that. But do you think New London has any kind of racial problem that you as mayor would and could address to increase the sense of community. So is there a problem and what would you do? There is, uh, but I would say first that the reason why we have not had explosive protests in New London is twofold. Number one, it's because the leadership of the city has already been doing those things. The police reforms that I did several years ago, long before Ferguson, uh, helped the situation here in New London, where the immediate feeling that we are under oppression by the police is not there because you are not, or at least not to the extent, anything close to the extent uh, that you were. So people's anger expressed in New London has largely been about past incidents of abuse in the city and or things that are happening outside the city. And I think that's due in part to the reforms that I initiated. But I will also say that the second reason why those protests didn't get out of hand is that when the deputy chief, acting through normal protocols without really giving much thought to what the political impact would be, got an advisory from the FBI, your city may be the site of major protests. He was very responsible about that. He wanted to order riot gear. And I stopped the purchase of the riot gear because in the event of a major incident, we can have rapid response teams here. We don't necessarily need that equipment on, on hand. And the purchase of it at that time would have inflamed a situation that wasn't inflamed. <coughs> a lot of protests have all been peaceful. I've been at them myself. And they're fine. But the idea of having police purchasing riot gear or showing up in riot gear could bring other protesters, even from outside New London, into New London and create a focal point here that didn't naturally exist. So I think that in part my actions uh, suppressed that and allowed us to have peaceful protests in New London as opposed to the strife that we've seen elsewhere. But the disparity that I see, the strongest disparity racially, is in education. And the reason why I say that is because we're segregated. Part of the greatness of the all-magnet school plan is that it creates an integrated school district. Ever since Brown versus Board of Education, civil rights activists from Martin Luther King on knew that integration was the goal of bringing the races together. You know, Martin Luther King's favorite saying was that 10 a.m. on Sunday morning was the most segregated hour in America. Um, we need to interact with each other because as the community interacts with each other, we know that we're all the same. And where that's done the most is in childhood and in school. And if our schools are thoroughly integrated, 
and regionally integrated. So they're not just integrated on race and ethnicity, but they're also inter integrated socioeconomically. That will help everyone. It gives people in the region a perspective. If you're a kid from Stonington, but you grow up and go to school with a kid from a project in New London, you think differently about the kids in those projects and the people in those projects. If you're a kid in the projects or with a single mom or you're African American or whatever the case may be, but you understand that if you do certain things and you go to school, that you can get a better life. And there is a better life because of your interaction with people who are at different economic levels. I think that it will breed greater racial harmony and greater regional understanding uh, across the line. Because when you talk to people in Ledger, um, and they talk about people in New London, they say all sorts of crazy things. And I go on 94.9 all the time and challenge them on it and say, no, you're wrong. You know, it's not a bunch of lazy people on welfare, you know, living in New London. It's a bunch of people working two and three minimum wage jobs, struggling like crazy, doing the hardest jobs that there are and trying to just provide for their kids and have a better life and they're all really nice people and they all help each other all the time. But if you never interact with them, you wouldn't know that. And a lot of those people think that everyone in the wealthy white community is out to get them. And they're all horrible, callous people, you know, and whatever else. And they're not. But it's the lack of understanding, the lack of interaction that leads to those attitudes. And the best way to address it is when people are young. And if people grow up together in an integrated environment, that will foster the greatest long-term racial cooperation that I feel that we could possibly have. And I think that that's why it's extra special that we have this opportunity to go to the first all-magnet district in the state. Um, switching gears, um, how would you assess your record on encouraging economic development and what would be your strategy in a second term in that regard? Well, I would say that I believe we have uh, stronger economic development now than we did four years ago. There is greater occupancy in downtown. People say, you know, there's all the vacant storefronts. Well, the vacant storefronts have been there for a long, long time. Do you know what the occupancy rate is? I don't know the exact number, and I should have checked that before I came to this meeting. Uh, I can follow up with you. But because of the Create Here Now program and several other small businesses that opened on their own, we've lost a few businesses, like we've lost Klingerman Travel, but a smoke shop opened next door. Uh, we lost the porn shop, thank God, uh, but uh, New London Inc. expanded into their facility. Uh, we have the eyeglass lass. We have Bike New London shop set up on Upper State Street. High Fives opened about two years ago. Hannafin's moved next door but expanded and still open. Uh, and when you look at, like, say, Upper State Street, and the maker space is there, or State of Makers is there, you have, you had one successful business up there retail business, bar, restaurant, and that was uh, Hannafin's. Now you have one, two, three, four, five in that same in that same block near the guard. Can you tell us what downtown business people support your campaign? Yeah, uh, Donnie O'Neill uh, at the Brass Rail uh, does and has my sign up. Uh, there are other businesses that do, uh, and there are a lot of high-end, very wealthy property owners whose taxes went up who support me, uh, but I'm not going to rattle off the names because they don't want people knowing they support me. What is that? Most of City Center District vehemently despises me. Why? Um, because Bill Cornish, let's uh, use him for example, he petitioned all the budgets for years. He's responsible for the 0% increases and the fact that everything you know, ran out and everything fell apart because he pushed it for years. He wanted no taxes. He keeps his buildings barely up to code. His parking garage, I don't even know if it is up to code, to be honest. Um, he pays people under the table. You know, he, he, he's run that kind of a business in New London for decades. Pay and city, pay city official under the table? No, not city officials, but his own, you know, workers oh. who work in oh. his buildings and things like that, fixing things up. And, you know, I don't really care, you know, how Bill Cornish runs his business, but Bill Cornish is not going to dictate to the city of New London that our schools fall apart because he doesn't care. And all he cares about is getting the absolute last nickel that he can wring out of whatever business he can legally run in town. And that's wrong. So is it taxes primarily you think the city center district people are upset Taxes, about? taxes, absolutely. You have to figure the, the crowds that came to city council, again, with one or two exceptions, all over 50 years old. With the exception of Tony Suarez, no Latinos. With the exception of Bill Cornish, no African Americans. And half the people who testified to city council don't live in New London. There were 34 people, I think, who testified, and I think 15 or 16 don't live in New London. 
But they, some of them run businesses in New Lenox. Of course they do, and we welcome their business. But the bottom line is, is that you can't come into a community and say that thousands of kids don't get an education because you never want to see a tax increase. I'm sorry, because they're never going to want to see a tax increase. They've never wanted to see a tax increase. They've fought every single tax increase ever. And whether it's 1% or 10% or 5%, they are for 0%, always. And I said no and beat them. And that infuriated them. When we took the referendums to November, built a strong campaign, and passed it all over their objection, and didn't just pass it, but passed it two to one, that's where they absolutely went off the deep end because they realized, oh my God, we cannot control this. We're not the only powerful people in town anymore. And we're not the only people who matter. And they're not used to that because, quite frankly, for decades of doing business, they could pick up a phone and get whatever they needed, even if everyone else got nothing. I remember one clear conversation I had with Bill Cornish three years ago. Where I said to Bill, and, and by the way, I'm mentioning Bill because Bill's got the thickest skin in town. He'll come to a town meeting and say right to my face, what a jerk I am. I'll say what a jerk he is, and we'll have coffee the next day. So I, I'm, I'm picking on somebody that I think can, can handle it. Um, and we've dueled in your articles in the paper. But I went to Bill and I said, Bill, we've level funded our schools for years. The high school, I went and looked, it is falling apart. Don't you want kids in the city to have a shot? Without missing a breath, he fired back at me. Nobody gave me a shot. And that's the attitude. Well, I don't have that attitude and we're going to disagree. And particularly when they are, I think, used to being able to dictate policy and now they can't, I think they're very, very upset and uh, they just want to get rid of me. Um, some of it, I think, is just get even. Um, I don't even know if they really realistically believe that anything's going to improve with their taxes under Mr. Passero. He voted for all the same but budgets. You keep mentioning you know? Mr. Passero, there's seven members on the council. Is everything mm -hmm. that every vote against you or every disagreement you had just with him or is it with the majority of the council? Oh no, it's been mostly with him. He's directed it and the political winds have swung in his favor on the council because the council is living on the inside of the bubble and I think they thought, reading your paper and seeing who was coming to council meetings, that I was dead in the water. And politically they felt it was better to run with Mike since he had the DTC locked up. He had it since his caucus coup a couple of years ago when he brought in a bunch of Tea Party people and you know, won a majority of the DTC, but that didn't concern me because I always known it's going to be decided in a primary. Um, but most of the primary voters only come out at the very end. They don't come to city council meetings. Most of the voters in November only come out at the very end. Um, but I think the councilors were scared uh, for their own re-elections, for their own renominations, uh, to go with the flow, let Mike do his thing, <coughs> and if he loses, fine, we'll jump back on with the mayor. If he wins, great, we're with him and we can work with him. And I think the council just got politicized and quite frankly a lot of old uh, New Londoners uh, came up to me very upset and I won't rattle off all their names uh, but there are a lot of them when the council did what they did this budget cycle because it was blatantly obvious that they were trying to appease the same people that come and yell about the budget every year who aren't representative of the community as a whole after the community just voted two to one for our budgets by the way but they're going to listen to this crowd of 30 half of whom don't live in town and screw up the budget by deliberately underfunding line items. Like blatantly, just, no, we got that bill, we're not going to pay it. People saw that and they, literally, this is the thing I heard most, knocking doors, going around town, people come up to you in the supermarket. This line, the council's always done that. That's what the new London count, oh God, they always do that, especially in an election, blah, 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 blah. And I think by saying no, we have to balance the budget. No, you're off track. I'm going to do what I have to do to make sure we balance. As difficult as that is at the time, and as much as some people think, oh, the mayor's a jerk, I think most people who are quieter in town um, say, well, I'm glad he's there. I'm glad he's there doing it. Because if he wasn't there keeping all that in check, they'd just go right off, the, right off the financial rails again and do the same thing that they were doing for years before he got here. But those people aren't going to show up and yell and scream. They're not going to write letters to the paper. They're not going to show up with a t-shirt on. They're just going to go vote. And they're voting. And I know who they are. And I talked to them, been talking to them for four years. And they always vote. You know who the voters are. And 
that's what's going to decide the election, not the, 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 the controversy of the day or the up or down that might occur on any given day in the paper or at a council meeting or anywhere else. Trying to pull it back to economic development, a lot of uh, mayors can become popular if shops fill up, if we saw uh, development at Fort Trumbull. So, you know, if you could talk about what your vision is, sure. if you were given a second term of how we can... Uh, well, I see some economic growth in London. Let me start with the easy one, and you're going to laugh or smirk. But the easy one is Fort Trumbull, because it's one of two options. Either we're taking back the land and we're develop developing it directly, which I believe would be easier and faster and cheaper, because private development is very difficult to get moving anywhere, but particularly in New London. When you get involved in a private development project, you realize that there are about eight different funding levers that have to move to make the project work. They usually need an abatement. If they don't need an abatement, which can be very politically laden, they need some form of state funding. They need federal funding. They need this. They need that. They need the development agency to sign off on something. They need us to sign off on something. They need remediation funds. Sometimes that comes through a grant. So we're constantly going after multiple different little pieces to get a project to move. And oftentimes the projects fall apart because if any one of those pieces fails to click, the door doesn't open. And it often takes years to get a project to move. But the government can move a project much, much faster. Example, if the government owned the land on 3C in Fort Trumbull, right as you enter the fort. If we own the land, we could partner with the state of Connecticut. Under the governor's jobs bill, there was an 80% funding mechanism for any shovel-ready revenue-generating project. I am on the understanding that those funds have not all been used yet. You could build a mixed-use integrated parking garage there. And no, not pave paradise and put up a parking lot but a parking garage similar to ones in Yonkers, New York, and Stamford, Connecticut, where it doesn't look like a parking garage. It looks like an industrial building with green plantings off the side, solar on top, geothermal, completely environmentally self-sustaining, and on the first floor, retail shops, a Starbucks, a something, or whatever. Now, all those EB people that are parking down there would park there, and they would pay money to park there. The city would own the garage. We get revenue from it. Then, if we put a band shell with state money, which the state's willing to do, at Fort Trumbull itself, a state park, then you could have major events on the weekend down there, like the Newport Folk Festival, and they will park in the garage. And that garage will generate revenue to the city of New London. Perhaps more than a building would generate in tax revenue. Perhaps less. But we can get that thing built and built quickly. It addresses major concerns for economic development because it assists EB, our number one taxpayer and number two employer, it allows for bigger events down there, allows for more development down there because anything you develop down there, people need to park, and that's something that can move fast. We could also build a building and lease it out. Nothing preventing us from doing that, and we'll be able to build a building at very low lending rates because governmental lending rates are extremely low, faster than any private developer will be able to move down there. So if we took the deeds back, which is what I've always wanted to do, I believe that development at Fort Trumbull could move quicker and faster and more efficiently Believe it or not, under government direction, as much as people think that government is so inefficient and private business is so great, I think we could do a better job of it than the private developers could. But the reason why I say Fort Trumbull is easy is because there's an easy option, too. Option two is we don't get the deeds back, and I've already agreed to work with RCDA, and we've got AR builders on the hook to start the project. If the apartment complex works out well for them, they've expressed interest in doing other projects throughout the fort. There are other developers online. And we'll go that route and do the best we can at it, work with them, and try to get it to move forward. But one way or the other, we're going to move something forward at Fort Trumbull. The question just becomes, do we continue down the private developer, corporate-backed track, or do we try something that's more government-directed, smaller scale and organic, which I think could happen quicker? Who knows? But something's going to move at Fort Trumbull one way or the other. As to downtown, this is the harder one. This is the one that people aren't thinking of. I talked to David on the street about it briefly one day. We were in the tax discussion. And I said, well, you know, taxes can't necessarily go down. Although now I have a slightly different view because that conversation was before the passage of pilot. Pilot legislation said something interesting. It said your governmental spending must be kept to 2.5%, but debt service is excluded from that. Which means if we can keep the governmental budget at 2.5% and we still have extra money from pilot, we can direct that money, along with grant monies, because grant monies can go to debt service, into our debt service fund. That will pay for all of our capital improvements. Because debt service 
we only need to increase debt service slightly because the lending rates are so low. You can loan a million dollars right now. You wouldn't have to pay anything in year one. You'd have to pay about 15 grand in year two, and then it goes up to like 30 grand, and then it goes up to like 60 grand, and then it's 60 grand a year to loan a million dollars right now, and you wouldn't even have to make a payment on it for a year, and then your payment in year two is like $15,000. That's like free money. And if we have pilot funds from the state that are in excess of our spending cap that we can keep to on our own, we direct that to debt service and then we can pay for all these capital improvements. So I don't believe that the improvements that will be needed downtown will necessarily hit taxpayers. But they're going to need to be done. And this is where it gets really rough and no one's thought about it. If 25% more yield goes on our water and sewer infrastructure in downtown New London, all our pipes will burst, according to our public utilities director, Lanza Fami. We have 100-year-old wooden water pipes in downtown, and our entire storm drain system is ancient, antiquated, falling apart, clogged, etc. We all know this. This is a well-established fact. We also need better parking. We also need better street design patterns to bring people into New London rather than simply shovel them out of New London with the museum coming. We have to redesign everything around the fact that we could have half a million to a million people coming into downtown New London. We have to prepare for that. Now, everybody in center, city center district wants this because they see that once it's built, it is going to be the biggest economic driver for downtown New London. And when integrated into the Thames River Maritime Heritage Park, this could be a primary economic driver for our entire region. If Alan Plattis can be believed that more people uh, walk the Freedom Trail and go through the gates at Disney World, this thing's going to be huge for us and for Groton that is facing similar issues to New London right now, budgetarily wise, grandless wise, etc. It's a huge improvement. But we've got to rip up all the streets. We've got to replace all the pipes. We've got to redesign street patterns. That's not going to take a week. It's not going to take a month. It's going to take months. It's going to be an extensive redevelopment <coughs> of downtown infrastructure that will rip up parking spaces, that will disrupt businesses. It's going to be very, very tough. And many of the same people that are all on board with the project are going to scream bloody murder when this construction phase takes place. And I think that that's something to consider, that you're going to need a very strong mayor who says, no, this is, this is the best shot we have for economic development. We're going to make it happen because if you're going to listen to those 34 people that will come to a council meeting and scream and you cave to them, National Coast Guard Museum isn't happening. So I understand the difficulties that are going to take place over the next four years. And I'm not sitting here saying that everything's going to be rosy. It's not. It's going to be tough to build the National Coast Guard Museum. It's going to be tough to build the all-magnet school district, finding swing space for students, moving people around as buildings get reconstructed. It's going to be a tough job. And it's going to take years. Um, but I know that, and I'm prepared for it, and I'm going to see it through, because this stuff has to happen. You know, New London is not going to get a chance like this again. We have tried everything from Captain's Walk to Eminent Domain to Pfizer to fill in the blank, hasn't worked. <coughs> Forming our school system, an integrated school system with school choice, with brand new facilities backed up by state funds, every city in America dreams about that, and a national museum that could bring hundreds of thousands of people in, a combined historic tourism destination loop that could bring over a million people in if marketed properly. N new London can't say no to that. Uh, but it's not going to be just a piece of cake getting there. Um, and I think looking at Mr. Passero's record and looking at mine, uh, I would have a much higher confidence that I'd see it through uh, than I would that he would. Let's leave that. Uh, yeah, we're kind of on <coughs> and we told the candidates to keep them all to sure. an hour, so I we'll, uh, guess that gets to be your closing. Okay. And we uh, thank you for coming in. All right. All right. Well, I, I, I appreciate the opportunity. Uh, but there's one thing I, I would be very remiss if I didn't say in departing. Uh, shortly after I was elected, Greg Stone uh, gave me a book called The Day. And I read a fascinating <coughs> bit about Theodore Bodenwine, who I see up at Cedar Grove every now and then. He appears to be doing well. Uh, he still gets his delivery of his paper. Uh, and he lived in New London, I might add, uh, down on Pequot. But I read that they pushed for the creation of the city manager because they could not control the mayor. And that's true. And I know that one of the difficult adjustments for the establishment in New London has been a difficult adjustment for the day. 
because the mayor of the city of New London isn't primarily accountable uh, to this institution, <coughs> primarily accountable to the people of the city. And I hope that when you consider your endorsement, you consider not only your own institutional perspectives and your own uh, corporate interests, but that you consider the people of New London uh, who are ultimately going to be served by this and uh, recognize that Mr. Bodenwine uh, was right. The New London Day cannot control the mayor of New London, uh, but this mayor, at the very least, has answered every FOI request you've ever issued, returned every phone call you've ever made, and I always will. All right, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.